therefore the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have called us to be a part of your body. May we be one as you ask us to be, and as you are leading us to be. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, we have talked about so far the via media, the Anglican way. Uh, Rachel started this off with a sort of survey of uh, all of Anglicanism. It was very masterfully done in like one class. And how our tradition as Anglican is a unique tradition that is both Protestant and Catholic, uh, Lutheran and Calvinistic, prayer book, uh, and, well, prayer book. We'll just leave it there. Uh, evangelical, Anglican. Catholic, all of these different parts of our tradition uh, are built into who we are and that we sort of pro provide a middle way, a way of being Christian that is unique, that isn't the least common denominator between everything, but actually is its own way of being a follower of Jesus. Uh, we followed that. Uh, Jason talked about the 39 articles and how those present a unique way of being Anglican. Uh, and then last week was the prayer book. And this week, we will be talking about the Anglican communion, um, which is uh, the communion in which we are a part. So, just imagine with me, when you think of an Anglican, what do you think? Each province is a, a certain region, 
Uh, often it follows national lines, but not always. So the Episcopal Church <laughs> forms a province, part of a province, but we also include uh, beyond just America, as part of the Episcopal Church, we also have uh, churches in, I believe Cuba was just re-admitted uh, into the Episcopal Church, so Cuba is a part of the Episcopal Church. We have churches in Europe. Um, the American Cathedral of Paris is sort of a big one. Um, the Church of Haiti uh, is a part of the Episcopal Church. So it's not simply, province isn't simply along national lines but often more or less follows that. Um, these provinces, with their churches in these 165 countries, are largely autonomous. And again, we'll talk about that's a good thing and a really bad thing at the same time. So each church, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, the Anglican Church in Mexico, they all have their own uh, prayer books. They have their own canon law, which is actually really important. It is their own rules that govern them as a body. And they are not uh, dependent on any other church from any other province in their own procedures uh, in being a church. Now, part of being in communion is being relationship with others who do have a certain uh, sway over us, and we'll talk about how this has played out in our community. So how did it form? So the Anglican Communion begins with William of Orange and William of Wallace. Uh, so this is a bit of British history, but I, I like, when you start, if you're listing all the monarchs, the, the, my eyes are like glaze, like amazing, I'm like, uh, so if I get this wrong, help me out here. So what happened after the Civil War, which we talked about uh, in the first week, which was a big part of uh, Anglican history, the Civil War when the uh, Presbyterians took over England and ran the show for a little bit, and England became a parliament, uh, or became a republic and not a uh, monarchy, is that uh, after that we have King James, and James II comes into Rome. And James II is Roman Catholic, which is a problem. Why is this a problem? If you remember, why would James having a Roman Catholic monarch be a problem? Because the king and the pope. So they, the king and the pope, they, they like don't even text anymore. <laughs> like, they're, they're dead to each other. So that, uh, but it's connected with the Pope, yeah? Because the monarch of England is the head of the church. The monarch of England is the head of the church. And so if you have a Protestant church called the Church of England, and your monarch is Roman Catholic, it presents a, a little bit of a dilemma. It would be like, I should say, almost like if St. Albans hired a, as a priest someone who was a Baptist. And uh, what would we do with that? We'd be like, wait, what? how does this work? This doesn't work like this. So this is what happened in England. James II is Roman Catholic. It comes to a crisis when he has a son, uh, and all of a sudden people are starting to worry that there will be a Catholic dynasty in England, that the Stuarts, the family of the part of, that they are, the monarchs will continue to be Roman Catholic, uh, presents a real problem for the church. So what the happens is the glorious revolution uh, when uh, William of Orange, who is a uh, grandson of Charles II, I believe, and his wife Mary, who is his cousin, also related to Charles, uh, when they come from Holland and oust James out of the throne and William becomes the monarch of England. And they have a good Protestant monarch, replacing the, the bad Catholic one, who is problematic to the Church of England. So where this gets, how does this have to do with the Anglican Communion? Well, here's how. This is the Anglican Communion starts out of this, essentially. Because in Scotland, uh, the Scottish are particular and uh, don't always care for the decisions made 
uh, for them by their uh, neighbors in the south, the Scottish bishops in particular do not swear allegiance, refuse to swear allegiance to William of Orange. They say, nope, James II was the rightful monarch uh, anointed by God, and we are not going to swear allegiance to William. And this creates, by this simple fact, the first uh, church outside of the Church of England creates really kind of the first province, although they don't see it like this, because it isolates Scotland from the Church of England. The Scottish bishops are bishops. They are recognized as such, but they cannot serve in England and vice versa. Um, and so you have, all of a sudden, Anglicanism in a unique area is spreading, is becoming, uh, breaking away from the Church of England because of the Church of Scotland. They're called Jacobites. Um, just so you know, the oath of allegiance that the Scottish bishops refuse uh, to swear is something that if you get ordained in the Church of England right now, you still have to swear an oath of allegiance to the Queen. She still is the head of the Church. Um, so, so here it is. I uh, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. This is still a part of the canon law and the practice of the Church of England. And right here, because of this issue over uh, who the rightful monarch is, we see a church that is formed, is indebted, that is connected to the Church of England, forming its own uh, body, in a way. And this becomes really important uh, for us as part of the Episcopal Church, because what happens is, of course, this revolution in 1776, and this oath uh, becomes a problem when you're an American uh, uh, pastor. Uh, to swear allegiance to King George, you maybe don't want to do that. Um, and so the, as the American Revolution takes place, as uh, just to note, a lot of Episcopalians or Anglicans flee north to Canada, but the church actually almost dies in the U.S. because most Episcopalians were loyal, most Anglicans are not Episcopalians, but were loyal to uh, the crown. Um, I have particular thoughts on this that I won't share at some point. The American Revolution, I'm glad, proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free, as the song goes. <laughs> However, uh, it is worth noting that the American Revolution was a bloody war between Christians of the same denomination. It, that should make us a little uncomfortable uh, over maybe legitimate reasons, uh, taxation, things like that, but still Christians killing other Christians. Christians in the same church killing each other. It should be unsettling for us today that this is the case. Um, and so what happens is the Episcopal Church, uh, now severed from England because of the uh, Revolutionary War, we've had all of these um, Church of England parishes in the U.S., uh, no bishops, the Bishop of London was still the bishop for the American colonies. Super complicated, right? If you need a priest in your, in uh, oh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and your priest is retiring or wants to retire and you need a new one, uh, you, you can't just make a new priest. You have to have a bishop. And so you, say you have someone who you've trained up uh, in your community to seek holy orders, they have to take this journey to England Bishop of London, uh, be ordained, and then come back. And this is like a month, two month long trip. Yeah, and you could very well die on the way, on the way back. So uh, part of what happens is already prior to the Revolutionary War, the Episcopal Church is shifting, changing, modifying a bit from what was going on in England. Our whole vestry system that we have in the American Episcopal Church the vestry is the uh, group of leaders in the parish who are in charge of the finances, uh, building. Uh, is an important part.
are in Episcopal parishes, that is an innovation that occurs simply because of a lack of priests. Uh, there's not enough priests, so we're going to do morning prayer, because a lay person can lead it, and we'll get a, a circuit rider, you know, priests will ride, come by when they can, and the vestry now has a lot of power and control. I think I read, and this astonished me, that in the Church of England, they have their equivalent of the vestry, the PCC, the Parish Church Council, Consultative Council, uh, something like that. It's not informed until the 20th century. And so, I mean, really, it's, it's a clergy run. And you don't have the same sort of lay leadership. Also, what happens in the U.S., something in the air, uh, we're all at heart essentially Baptist. Even the Roman Catholics are basically Baptist. Uh, in the U.S., there's a strong congregationalism in our country, and this infects the Episcopal Church. I use infection as though that's purely a bad thing. Uh, I mean, it's a good, it's a mixed thing, right? It's, it's a mixed blessing, uh, like everything. And this gives our church its particular character. So already you have, even prior to the Revolutionary War, a church that is forming, that is part of the Church of England, but it is forming its own unique way of being a part of the Church of England. It is being Anglican in a different kind of way than what went on in uh, England. And this, of course, comes to a head when we need bishops after the Revolutionary War. Bishops have to swear an oath of allegiance. Can't happen. And so they, uh, the uh, Samuel uh, Seabury, the first bishop in the Episcopal Church, goes to Scotland. Consecrated the bishops because those bishops, remember, they didn't have one to do with the English crown either. And so they were more than happy to consecrate someone who didn't want to do anything with the English crown. Samuel Seabury is gets an unfortunate appearance in Hamilton, uh, which I, I I have not seen and don't recommend it to me. At this point, I have had ample opportunity to watch it. I'm not gonna watch it. Um, it's just not gonna happen, it's too late. Um, Samuel, C but I did watch the clip of Samuel Seabury, where uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda sort of make whatever Hamilton. He's Hamilton, right? Okay. See, I don't know. <laughs> uh, basically makes fun of Seabury, um, which is a, a raw deal for Seabury. Seabury uh, is a loyalist. He was against the whole Revolutionary War. Uh, I believe he had to hide out in Canada for a little while. Amazingly, he was able to come back and become a bishop in the church, and people were cool with it. Um, some people were, that's another conversation, not everyone likes him, Seabury. But he goes to Scotland, where he is consecrated the uh, first bishop in the Episcopal Church. This is the Episcopal Church flag, and it has the, part of our emblem is the St. Andrew's Cross uh, of Scotland. And to sort of commemorate um, this founding. Yeah. So was the need to be consecrated uh, to kind of continue the apostolic succession rather than the church in America just saying we're making our own bishops? So was that? Yeah, so you can't, that? that's exactly right. Yes, yeah, so you, our, our polity, and they, this stayed in the Episcopal Church. They wanted as much as possible, and you can read uh, the first American prayer book has a wonderful preface where it basically Thing, as much as possible, we want to keep to the canon law, to the theology, to the doctrine, and the worship of the Church of England. And in the Church of England, to be a, become a bishop, uh, you have to be consecrated by other bishops, uh, by at least one other, typically three other bishops. Uh, lay their hands on you and pray over you. Um, and so in order to keep that, in order for there to be clergy in the U.S. in order so for the church not to completely die out or to so radically change that it becomes something else, which is what the Methodists did, by the way. This is, it happened another way. John Wesley is a priest in the Church of England, is a missionary in Georgia uh, of mixed success, I believe, and he wants to get more missionary priests to come into the U.S., so that the churches can grow. And what happens is the Church of England says no. Again, this is part of the Revolutionary War, Bishop of London. They don't really care that much about us at this point. 
Um, and so John Wesley says, okay, then I'll make my own. And he, that, that's the birth of Methodism as its own denomination. Uh, but for the Episcopal Church, then called Protestant Episcopal Church, they wanted to avoid that. So what you have happened is the first province outside of the Church of England, because Scotland's still its own weird little thing, the first unique uh, breakaway from the Church of England that is still somehow connected with the Church of England, uh, is still indebted to the Church of England, is formed in the Protestant Episcopal Church. We are, I believe that we're not fully in communion with England until 1840. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't mean people would go back to England to go to Oxford or Cambridge and then come back to the U.S. to serve. Uh, that sort of thing still happens. You know, in 1812, England couldn't give us up, and so they did this thing in 1812. Uh, so it, the dust had to settle a little bit and before we were uh, fully um, in full communion with the Church of England, meaning it was easy for our clergy to go back and forth to serve in their churches in Westbrook. So this is really the birth of the Anglican communion. Anglican communion is through the creation of the Episcopal Church by the Revolutionary War. Neil, when did yes. the discussion for another time, but there is a Methodist Episcopal Church. So, yeah, so there's a Methodist Episcopal it Church, and then there's an Methodist, African Methodist yes. Episcopal Church. A I don't know. The AME. So I don't know anything about the Methodist Episcopal Church. I think they're breakaways in the early 20th century. The AME uh, breaks away because Absalom Jones and founder of AME. Crickets, crickets, crickets. Well, Basically, they had to sit in, they, they weren't allowed to serve. And they were African-American, uh, uh, black, and they were not allowed, basically, to That's serve, to do anything in the Episcopal Church. And so they formed their own church. Mm -hmm. so it's a great spot in our history there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite, quite horrible. Established. Does everyone know what I mean by established? 
The meaning is it's state supported. It's the, the, the church of the land. Uh, your taxes go to support that church. This happens a little bit in the American colonies for a while, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't last. And what happens in Canada, this happens in New Zealand, happens in Australia, as Anglicanism spreads, for a while it is the established church, but as those nations begin to gain their own sense of self, somewhat independent from England, the church becomes disestablished. In part because you have a lot of religious dissidents from other denominations coming to these countries. So Anglicanism spreads all over the world. Uh, it makes its way to Africa, um, to India, and all of the, the problems of colonialism uh, are sort of baked into the Anglican Communion as it forms. Uh, it's not until, I think, 1867, my notes here, that the first, 1864, uh, it's not until 1864 that we get the first African, uh, indigenous African bishop of the church in Nigeria. So this, the British have been in Africa for a very long time at this point, but uh, they were hesitant due to colonial, colonialism, due to racism, uh, to uh, make bishop and to raise up local indigenous clergy. There's a big shift in the late 19th century, a push to start having indigenous uh, clergy uh, in the church, but it, it, uh, as you can imagine, it runs up against a lot of opposition. The same thing in the American Episcopal Church. We've already men mentioned the AME and how that forms. Um, one of my uh, heroes in our denomination is a uh, Emma Gaboa, who was a Native American in Wisconsin, Minnesota, one of those frozen chosen places. Wonderful places. Wonderful places. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and he is they, they, the, the American the Episcopal, the Episcopal Church says, "Well, we can make him a deacon. We can do all this deacon's work." Um, and he wanted to be a priest. Priest felt called to be a priest, but he had to wait 20 years before they finally relented and made him a priest. Um, and I just think of the devotion to like the perseverance for 20 years to like feel so called that you're going to wait at the church that clearly doesn't want you. Um, it, it's amazing. So this happens in our communion as the communion spreads. There's it only is slowly do they allow um, indigenous leadership in the various nations where the Church of England exists, where the Anglican Communion has gone, uh, to rise up. Uh, Samuel Crowther uh, gets his PhD from Oxford, I believe, uh, goes to London. No, yeah, he's consecrated a bishop by the Archbishop of Canterbury, gets to meet the Queen, and is an incredible uh, bishop in Nigeria. <coughs> So now we're into the 19th century. See, we're moving quickly along here, folks. Um, as so, Anglicanism continues to spread, uh, and colonialism uh, is, continues to spread all the way through India. Uh, again, in the Church of India, we have a long conversation. They have their own unique quality. Each church takes on the unique characteristics of the nation it's in, while still being Anglican, connected. And we can talk a little about what does it mean to be Anglican when uh, you're a Christian community in Nigeria or in Australia. Um, and what happens is there, in the late 19th century, there is a push and a move for the churches founded by the Church of England to actually start talking with each other and maybe we should all come together. Anglican Communion is really new. Like this is the late 19th century. Uh, and so you have the first Lambeth Conference in um, the 1867, I believe, and it is a gathering of the bishops, all the bishops who attend, from all across the Anglican Communion at Lambeth Palace which is where the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, his residence, uh, just across the river in London. You can go there today. Um, and it's a gathering of all of these bishops from around the Anglican Communion. There's no uh, real agenda, just a time of prayer, sharing,
sharing, uh, working together uh, as missionary uh, missionary exploits grow, you often have com competition between different dioceses over sending missionaries, and part of what they're trying to do in this first land of comfort is work through some of these issues. But it's not attended by all the bishops in the Anglican community. And only progressively do we get more and more uh, bishops from around the communion uh, starting to attend. So, into the 19th or 19th, early 20th century, you start to have even greater unity between these churches. Uh, this is, continues, and is precipitated by the end of World War II, which also begins the end of the sort of British Empire. Is it uh, 1947, India gains its independence from England? Um, and similar things are happening all over the world. And so you have these churches that were part of the Church of England that are Anglican and part of these countries that are now increasingly distancing themselves, if not fully breaking away from uh, English rule. And they need, therefore, for uh, these churches to be able to talk with each other, to have some sort of unity that is not dependent on the nation state, but is actually based on uh, our Christian tradition and our uh, heritage and who we are as believers and Anglicans becomes even greater. Um, the Church of South India forms soon after this. It's an interesting uh, church that, again, unique polity. All of the Protestant churches in India join together to form this big church called the Church of South India, which they then progressively consecrate bishops, duly done, so that they can become fully members in the Anglican Communion. So now the Church of South India, if you were to go there, uh, you could be, it's Anglican, but its origin, you could have, you know, your father could have been a Presbyterian pastor, and now you are an Anglican priest, uh, because the church sort of developed this unique way. This by the way, this is something crazy about Anglicanism that it can do this sort of thing. This, when we talk about the middle way, this other way of being Christian, this is part of what we're saying. This flexibility, this way of maneuvering between uh, these different Protestant bodies uh, into greater Catholicity, into having apostolic succession, being a part of our community. So, we've gotten us to the 20th century. So what is the Anglican Communion? How is it organized? We mentioned provinces, uh, but what, what do these provinces do? So the Anglican Communion, there are four instruments of unity, which is interesting. We don't have a pope. Uh, we don't have a universal binding church council. Even though all of the bishops in the Anglican Church don't get together and say, this is what everyone must believe. We have instruments of unity, which is the different thing. The first is the Archbishop of Canterbury. We are here he is, Justin Welby, looking kind of dopey. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, the first Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, St. Augustine, 600s, uh, and there's been a significant church in England led by Canterbury since. Uh, so the Archbishop of Canterbury is seen as the first among equals. He's not our Pope. Justin Welby, you know, uh, in the news, and I don't want to get into this too much, you know, Pope Francis said some things about the Latin Mass with some, with some Catholics, right, various opinions about, and it's binding. Pope Francis says it, uh, and now it's going to happen, or theoretically going to happen. You know how when the authority says do something, it doesn't always happen. But it, 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 Archbishop Justin Welby, if he said to us, uh, Episcopal Church, you need to start saying the liturgy in Latin, uh, we would all just be like, okay, whatever, man. Like, <laughs> he, he, he wouldn't even say that because it, 
where he, where there's no binding effect. He is an instrument of unity. He is someone who the church says has a role in our church in gathering us together. So when we talk about the other instruments of unity, he gathers those bodies together. Someone uh, who is the first among equals of bishops, who has a certain spiritual authority, but not uh, a binding uh, sort of legislative authority over our church. So this is the guy that you pray for every week, just so you have the face behind the person. You pray for him every week, which is interesting uh, and is a sign of our communion and the importance of our communion. How long did I get to do this part of this Oh, I think, I don't know if there's like a term limit. Mm -hmm. Think Roman Williams was the archbishop or Yeah, they don't. I think I, there might actually be a limit on the amount of time they can serve. I don't know that. It's not like the papacy. But they do try. They do. I mean, yeah. And, and uh, uh, yeah, he's the Archbishop before Roman Williams. George Cato. Right. Rome. Is he still alive? No. No. So we only have two living. Um, yeah, they do change. And the presiding bishop, I didn't even go into this, part of what makes the Episcopal Church weird is that instead of having an archbishop, which is a really churchy sounding name, we have a presiding bishop. Uh, our polity is deeply influenced by American politics and the American system of governance. So we have a house of bishops that decide for things in the American Episcopal Church, and we have a house of deputies, uh, sort of like Senate and House of Representatives. And the House of Deputies is made up of uh, priest, uh, uh, bishop, and lay person from each diocese. So our own polity is unique. Most, uh, you know, how church stuff works, uh, the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, only until recently did they have any authority either. It used to be the presiding bishop was simply the longest serving bishop in the church. They're like, well, you've been doing this for 20 years, you're the presiding bishop now. Okay, thanks. And they basically had, did nothing. Uh, they stayed in their diocese. They didn't, it was, there was no centralized uh, control. It was very much each diocese was autonomous. Um, that's changed in recent years with our church. For good and ill, in my opinion. So, what makes Anglican communion a special relationship to the Archbishop of Canterbury? If the Archbishop doesn't invite your church to one of the gatherings of Anglicans, it's like a bad sign. So this is, where is the discipline? I'm very English, you're not invited. <laughs> um, we're having a tea party and you can't come. Um, uh, but it's a sign that you are uh, in breaking from the church. All of us know that probably about the ACNA, ACNA, Continuing Anglicans, uh, and they don't pray for the presiding, for Archbishop of Canada. They don't have the same sort of relationship to the Church of England that we do because they, you've intentionally broken uh, away. So another instrument of unity that makes our church unique, the Lambeth Conference. Uh, this is, again, we mentioned this began in the 19th century, it's now held about every 10 years. Here's the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Ron Williams. A little bit of a grainy picture there. Um, and he, uh, and this is all the bishops in the Anglican communion gathering together. So it's hundreds of bishops from all over from uh, Hong Kong to uh, uh, Malawi to Nigeria to Brazil to the US. All of the bishops gathering together for a time of prayer, fellowship, sharing, uh, discussion on shared ministry and mission. But it's, again, it's not a binding legislative body. It's more a time, it's, it's community. And this happens every 10 years. The next one is uh, 2022, so next year. Uh, another body, the Anglican Consultative Council, that you can tell this is a 20th century invention with a horrible name like that. Um, it's like, let's make it bureau most bureaucratic name we can. 
uh, for the church. And this is a group of clergy, lay, and bishops from around the Anglican Communion who are chosen. And they sort of, uh, they work very particular ways on shared mission and ministry, uh, relief, um, and doing uh, the more nuts and bolts work of the Anglican Communion. Again, the Lambeth Conference is bishops getting together to pray and to share. This is sort of the Anglican Church in action and implementation. Uh, you might, so this skull up here is Ed uh, Kaminsky? Kaminsky? Kaminsky. Uh, he was, he's the, was the Bishop of Oklahoma, and before that, he was uh, the Rector of Holy Spirit in Waco. years and have other meetings in between to carry out the work of the communion. The primates, primate means uh, simply the chief pastor, bishop, archbishop, presiding bishop, whatever you call them, of a province, and they gather in Canterbury. Here is our own uh, Michael Curry uh, right here. So this is not all of the bishops of the church. This is just uh, the head bishops gathering together. And again, it's not, they're not making rules and laws for the church to follow. It's much more undefined. It's prayer, it's sharing, uh, it's, it's uh, a that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that photograph is a Canterbury. So to be devil's advocate just a little bit, yeah. so they don't set law, they yeah. don't do this, but you're going to do what they say. What's that? But you're going to do what they say. No. Okay. Don't waste it here in America. So, <laughs> <laughs> seems like the bishop can decide what we're going to do. When the we're archbishop? The bishop here. The bishop. So, so I, guess, I guess it's not written, but it's like... But you're still going to do what I say. So, well, we need to be clear about the bishops that we have over us in the Episcopal Church. Okay. And the Archbishop of Canterbury and the bishops in other parts of the communion. The, uh, you know, yes. I would say, you know, we, yeah. And even in the American church, again, this is unique to America because of our own sort of innate congregationalism and... Uh, the vestry system, even then the bishop, you, we, we act as though everyone like the archbishop has so much authority. Uh, unless one of the clergy, like, unless Aaron, let's use him because he could fire me anytime, but unless Aaron is caught doing something really, really naughty, the bishop can't just get rid of him.
secrets are different, they don't have any power. <laughs> <laughs> It's completely, it's just about disintegrated, 
uh, in part because of, uh, well, a lot of reasons the Episcopal Church has played a part in that, whether rightly or wrongly, over issues of same-sex uh, marriage, and really 2003, uh, when Gene Robinson was consecrated a bishop of New Hampshire, he was openly gay man, what happened was that more conservative parts of our communion, including Egypt, so we're falling apart, but that bishop of Egypt was happy to have me come and stay there, even though he knew I was a Episcopalian. So it's complicated, right? Uh, because of that, uh, churches in Africa in particular began forming alliances called GAFCON, Global Anglican Future Conference, uh, is what that is, and they sort of formed their own alliances, and they started to say, look, we can be Anglicans apart from the archbishop. Uh, this is also what happens with colonialism. You know, when you're in Nigeria and there's like 40 million Anglicans, you sort of get sick of a little bitty country like England dictating to you like what you can do. Like, hey, we're our own thing now, folks. So this is also the wreckage of colonialism that is living out in real time. Um, and so uh, the... Uh, right now, with the, again, I've mentioned the Anglican Church in North America is a body that's formed that broke away uh, that the church churches, GAFCON in South America and Africa began to sort of form other church in the United States, this uh, Kara Anglican body that isn't in communion with Canterbury and is kind of doing its own but it's super complicated. Again, the bishop of Egypt, I had to email him, dear Bishop Lanier, can I come? And he was like, yeah, sure. No, no problem. I can help dictate. He gave an address at Cambridge, and he needs someone to dictate in English. He's like, hey, can you do this? I'm like, yeah, cool. And I did that. So, like, it's, it's a complex situation. The, the churches in Africa, in particular Uganda and Nigeria, uh, that have been most vocal against things like same-sex marriage, uh, it, it's it's more than just it's it's problematic how the language they use for all sorts of reasons. Recently, the Archbishop of Nigeria called gay people an infection. Like, ooh, like yeah, we don't do that, right? That's not good. We should speak out against that. Uh, uh, and if the Arch good Archbishop of Nigeria knew more gay Christians, maybe he would have a different uh, feeling about uh, gay faithful followers of Jesus in this country, and in fact, in his own country, because you can act as though there are gay people there, but, you know, there are. Um, and so that's super problematic, and yet we don't, and I want to end with this, we do not want to break relationship with these churches, because, so this year, I've got a couple reasons why, this year is Florence Leighton Hoy, the Episcopal Church, oh, we're so progressive, she is the first ordained priest in the Anglican Communion, ordained in 1943 in Hong Kong, because literally no one else could go to Macau where she's serving because of the Japanese uh, and the violence there was perpetrated. So the bishop of Hong Kong says, Florence, you're willing, you go. And she did this incredible ministry there. This is her with her congregation until she's ordained a priest. Uh, after she's ordained in the Archbishop of Canterbury at the Lambeth Conference, everyone's like, you can't have women priests. We're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. She willingly gives up her, or doesn't give up her course, <coughs> gives up her license. So she doesn't serve again as a priest until 1983 mm -hmm. when she immigrates to Canada and everyone recognizes we made a big mistake with this one. And in the intervening years, she serves not as a priest, just as a faithful Christian on the Chinese mainland, going up into the mountains to pray, hiding so that she doesn't get killed by Mao's China. So if we break communion, like, I don't want to be out of the church with her. Like, I need to be a part of her church. Um, this is, uh, the left here is Archbishop Janani Luan. I know we were running out of time. We're going to keep going. Church is over. <laughs> Janet and I, I mean, they can't start without me. So. <laughs> Janet and I, Luam, is Archbishop of uh, uh, Uganda. And for speaking out against Idi Amin is murdered. People believe Idi Amin himself murdered Luam. 
uh, Larry Adam Thompson, new deacon in our church, was mentored, as was I, by a man who was friends with Archbishop Moon. On the right, this is a man who's still living, Benjamin Kwashi. He's a bishop of Jos, Nigeria. I think there's 10 million Anglicans in his uh, diocese. Uh, and he is, he doesn't align, you know, he's spoken out against the Episcopal Church in a very uncomfortable way. And yet, he and his wife have, have adopted over 50 orphans that they care for, and they both have been repeatedly beaten, almost to the point of death. His wife had to get medical treatment in Houston because of their faith in Christ and their outspoken witness to caring for children. And so, what does it mean to be a part of this middle way? It's super uncomfortable. And it means you're in a relationship with some people who you really disagree with and who you don't maybe like. But as us, as Episcopalians, we don't want to break. I mean, I don't want to be a part of a church that doesn't have martyrs and doesn't have uh, these people from across the community. So how this works out in practice now, the, our official structures are sort of crumbling. Uh, recently, the Ugandan Archbishop didn't come to the last uh, uh, primate meeting. Uh, Bishop Curry and the Episcopal Church were sort of uh, slapped on the wrist, whatever that means, given that they, there's no like centralized authority by the Archbishop and the primates. Uh, given all this, there still is the work of the communion happening. Uh, we pray every week for Father Lucius Kaminga uh, and all saints in the meetings on that one. I'm going to end. Oh. <laughs> I, I feel comforted. I've seen Aaron walk in many times late. So in, so. And I'm going to end with a recent email uh, from Father Kaminga uh, from All Saints in Vidi Malawi that he sent uh, to Aaron and Beloved fathers, God is really good and wonderful all the time. God has kept us safe despite the calamities we have gone through. It came a time of first wave of COVID-19, second wave as well, and here we are in the third wave, but God remains faithful unto us. I'm very happy and delighted to hear from you since we last communicated each other last year in 2020 when I was in Canterbury. We got to go to Canterbury to do some extra study. But again, what does it mean to be a part of the communion? It means the Archbishop pays for Father Kaminga to go do some further study in Canterbury. Uh, I would like to express my apology since our communication is all about on and off. The type of phones I've been using are of second, if not third class standards, where their durability and capacity is somehow low. But I thank God for that, <laughs> because the Bible always teaches us to be thankful in everything. Uh, and this is great. Half a loaf of bread is better than none. Uh, by the way, how is St. Alban's family? I do hope that God is still in control. He is. Here things are partially well, hence the epidemic has affected our church activities in one way or the other, of which you are not spared because it is a global issue. For instance, in our case, the measures which have been in place are very hard because people are failing to gather in numbers, which results in a poor offering performance. As a result, we are failing to remit our quarter allocation. This time around, may I humbly request for some prayer items. Pray for my parish so that there may be some economic breakthrough. Pray for me so that my ministry may be a successful one. My desire is to receive the crown of life as Lord Jesus will come to judge the earth. And I perish and I will continue to pray for you and the entire family of St. Albans so that you can stand and proclaim the good news. And God bless you abundantly. And so the instruments of communion, we can think that polity, this is what makes us bound. It's in so many ways more than that. And it's praying for Father Lucius Kaminga and knowing that today in Nambidi, Malawi, perhaps gathered under a tree, is a church that is praying for us. All right, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs>